Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Pratish Tosh. And I'm Tracy McRae. Soggy sheets and pajamas and an embarrassed child. Oh. Are these a familiar scene in many homes? Let's try that again. That's okay. Um, soggy sheets and pajamas and an embarrassed child are a familiar scene in many homes. But bedwetting isn't a sign of toilet training gone bad. It's often just normal part of a child's development. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, only 5 million children in the United States wet the bed. So when should you be concerned? Can bedwetting be a sign of other urinary problems? Here to discuss bedwetting and other common pediatric urology problems is Mayo Clinic pediatric urologist, Dr. Patricio Gagoyo. Welcome to the program, Dr. Gagoyo. Great. Thank you both for having me. Is it as common? It seems like every kid wets the bed when they're little at some point. You know, Tracy, this is an incredibly common problem. And what's interesting, and you have alluded to already, is that this is just not discussed. We don't talk about it very often in social circles, but it's something that definitely affects a very large group of our children. And, uh, you know, we want parents and children to know that there is help. There are things we can discuss and talk about and try to make this condition a lot better for them. And so there's when kids are potty trained and then people will say, well, they're potty trained, but not at night yet. So right. how long is that span? How long does that usually take? Well, I always tell parents that, you know, when you think about normal toilet training, it's a very complex process and a very sort of complex sequence that children need to learn. I tell parents, you know, children learn how to talk, they learn how to walk, they learn how to jump, they learn how to say multiple complex things, and the last thing they learn how to do is how to toilet train. So it's really a very complex uh, sequence of events that have to happen both in the brain and in the bladder and in the sort of the connections that, that there are between the two organs. Um, it is very common to have children be dry during the day and yet have persistent nighttime wetting. And you can see that up to, you know, age six, seven, eight, nine, the child can be completely wet during the, during the nighttime and yet completely dry during the day. And, and that causes some concern, rightfully so, for parents of an otherwise healthy child. I always thought it was kids were too tired and they couldn't wake up to go to the bathroom. Right. Is that, is that just something that the old wives tell? You know, that's such a common misconception. And I tell parents that, you know, the, this condition is not the child's fault. I mean, of course, there's nothing that the child would rather do than to stay dry at nighttime. And, um, you know, they're not lazy. It's not that they're not getting up. And again, that's, that's something that we, we get a lot. And in, you know, it's, it's an interesting problem because for as common as it is, we don't have a lot of answers of why it happens. But what we do tend to see in these children is that it's primarily happens in boys more than more so than in girls, but happens in both genders. And what is very common in these children is they are very, very heavy sleepers. So if you tell the parents, you know, can you, uh, you know, make noise? Are they, you know, is little Johnny or little Sally a light sleeper? Oh, no, doctor, they you could drive a truck in there. They wouldn't know. And part of the reason we think this happens is this, these children are so asleep, their brain and sort of their brain function is so asleep that the signals from their bladder that their bladder is full doesn't seem to get to the right place. And so they have accidents. And once they mature and they get older and those networks develop and get better and those connections kind of mature a little bit better, the problem just tends to go away on its own. Well, wow, you know, I'm, I have a young child. So he's going to be 11 months old very soon. And so it's, I've got a little ways to think about this, but I'm listening very intently to what you have to say. Uh, and as we eventually t toilet train him and what have you, when should me or other parents start to get concerned that uh, this bedwetting is, is maybe more than uh, what would be normally expected? Right. No, that's a great question. And again, we get that quite a bit. I mean, I tell parents and, and patients that if this is isolated wetting at night in an otherwise healthy child with no other urologic problems, no history of urinary tract infections, no other medical conditions that require medications, no other major surgery, a completely normal, healthy child, um, it, there's really no reason to become alarmed as long as it's an isolated nighttime problem. Now, if you get into issues where the child has a urologic history, has had a lot of urinary tract infections, or if there's daytime and nighttime wetting, that is a big, big alarm for us. If you have daytime and nighttime wetting, uh, and otherwise a child that you wouldn't expect to have that, meaning after toilet training three, four, or five years old, that is when you really need to have a specialist come and take a look at this child, have a pediatric urologist evaluate them, because you can have certain conditions where you have daytime and nighttime wetting that really need to be checked up on. Now, you were saying if the child is a really heavy sleeper, or you just said urinary tract infections, are there other conditions that cause bedwetting? 
Well, isolated bedwetting, uh, and again, in, in an otherwise healthy child, is is not necessarily associated with other problems. Okay. You will usually see something else. Something else is going on. Again, daytime accidents. You can have stool accidents that are not just urinary accidents, but stool accidents during the day. Then you really need to evaluate, well, is this a problem with the nerves that go to the bladder? Is this a problem you know, in the brain and the brain processing? Is this the possibility that there's some anatomical or structural problem with the way the urinary tract has developed that it's going to predispose this child to wet. Uh, but again, isolated nighttime issues, really, we only become concerned if they're only at night, nothing during the day, no urinary tract infections. We become concerned when the parents become concerned, when the child becomes concerned, because it really becomes more of a social stigma. Absolutely. So what should parents tell kids? What do you want them to know? Because that's when the emotions can get all wrapped in, up into it. It gets to be a big problem. So right. what should parents be telling children? Right. Well, I think the most important thing for children to know is that they're not alone. You know, up to 10% of children between ages 6 and 8 will have this problem. So you can have a class full of children where three or four or even five are going to be affected. But again, no one talks about it. So that's the first thing I tell parents is tell your child that they're not alone. This is not a problem. They're not, you know, broken or there's not something wrong with them. This is very common. And number two is when this starts to become a social problem, when they say, you know, doctor, we really want Johnny to go to sleepaway camp. He's getting invited to these sleepovers. Sally wants to go, you know, spend the night at our grandmother's house, but they're embarrassed. When it becomes a social issue, it's an acceptance issue. They're really becoming a little bit ostracized uh, with activities. That's when we say, look, come see us. Let's evaluate your child. Let's talk about the options that are available to try to deal with the situation. If only they had the support groups for, for children, like at the playground, <laughs> Bedwetters Anonymous or something. Oh, yeah. Like we could uh, start that. That could be a thing. I, right. I don't know. Uh, you would mention a little bit about uh, urinary tract infections. Of course, that's an uh, infectious diseases doc asking you about uh, you're just how common are urinary tract infections, either related to bedwetting or, or on its own? Yeah, you know, this is, again, a very common problem. I mean, this uh, constitutes a good percentage of our practice, about 8 to 10 percent of girls and about 1 to 2 percent of boys before age 5 will have a urinary tract infection. So more common in girls just because of the way they're built, a little less common in boys, but we see it very, very commonly. And again, the main question with urinary tract infections is, how old is the child? How bad was the infection? Is this an isolated infection that just happened once? Is this something that's been happening a lot of times? Is it um, related to any other issues that we've seen in the past, either a prenatal history of urinary tract abnormalities or other things to consider? And is there an age when, typical age, when kids kind of grow out of this behavior or out of, out of bedwetting? Yeah, so back to bedwetting, you don't tend to see it very commonly in children after eight or nine, but you can certainly see it in children up to adolescence. And what does seem to happen is when children start to hit puberty, you know, a little bit earlier in girls, a little bit later in boys, but around the early teen and preteen years, it's very, very rare to see it. Now, as far as urinary tract infections, we see them fairly commonly in newborns and babies, so sort of infants, and that is a little bit more of a... Uh, you know, a situation that requires some follow-up a little bit more carefully. We also tend to see it around the age of potty training. So in age mm -hmm. three or four with girls, because again, they, they're learning kind of to hold everything in. And if you have sort of stagnant urine sitting in a bladder with a couple little bacteria, you can get in trouble. At what point, uh, you say it's fairly common, right? Right. Uh, at what point should parents be concerned? So again, in the babies, we have a fairly stringent way of evaluating them when they have a urinary tract infection with a fever, because there's sort of there's two flavors of urinary tract infections. There's urinary tract infections with fevers, what are called febrile urinary tract infections, and ones without fevers. They're kind of a different animal, because if there's fever involved, that usually means that the kidneys have been affected, that there's some element of kidney infection that, that comprises this infection, and that requires a little bit more... Um, demanding follow-up with some radiographic studies and, and such that, again, uh, either a pediatrician or in cases of, of uh, you know, more acute infections, a pediatric urologist can be involved in. We've been talking about pediatric urology with Dr. Patricio Gargoyo. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Gargoyo. Oh, thanks. Pleasure to be here.